the Acropolis in Athens, the wonder of the ancient and the modern world. But much of its glory is in London, in the British Museum. 200 pieces of exquisite marble torn from the Acropolis by this man, Lord Elgin. He was reviled as a thief, but also hailed as a saviour. How he got the marble from Athens to London is a tale of grandeur and deceit, of a man dazzled by art. art collection in the world lies this incredible story. When he was six, Thomas was sent off to England. A rich uncle, Lord Aylesbury, had thought it prudent to confer the benefits of an English education on his young Scottish nephew. Thomas grew up in an England that was starting to think of itself as one of the great civilizations. Comparisons were being made by patriots with ancient Greece. The English estates that Thomas saw were often inspired by classical antiquity. Dearest mother, this place is very handsome. First we come to an arch of stones, like a rock. Then we come to a cave. There is a dark passage that leads to a central chamber. And prepare yourself. There lies a nymph, very finely cut out on a piece of rock, in a sleeping posture. Before her is a cold bath, paved with marble, about five feet deep. The murmuring of the water gushing through the rock makes it the most charming thing ever known. What we see next is what they call the Pantheon. Within is a handsome high room, wherein are some remarkable fine statues. One in particular of Hercules, which is eight feet high, of one solid piece of marble. Thomas was being groomed for the elite. By the age of 20, the boy would be a Greek scholar and a gentleman soldier. And by 30, the soldier would become a diplomat. And as a diplomat, he would excel in the royal courts of Europe. For Elgin had charm, tact, 
considerable learning and an eye for the main chance. It was as a young diplomat that Elvin was introduced to the fashionable world of collecting and classical antiquity. What he saw, he adored and coveted. But it made the austere family home at Broom Hall look crude and trivial. So in 1798, Elgin demolished it and then hired an architect, Thomas Harrison, to design something more splendid. Harrison, like his master, was a Greek enthusiast and not a modest man. His plans for Broom Hall were lavish, a 52-room mansion in the classical style, equal to the size of Elgin's ambition, but way beyond the depth of his purse. Harrison was sent home, his plans shelved. It was a young woman who showed Elgin the way to revive his scheme. Mary Nesbitt was 21, pretty, headstrong, and well-born. Elgin could not keep away from her. and Mary were married in 1799. Mary was a beautiful bride with a handsome dowry. She made Elgin happy and rich. Her money and enthusiasm breathed fresh life into his architectural ambitions. 1799 was a joyful year for Lord Elgin for another reason. Soon after the wedding, he was appointed ambassador extraordinary to the Ottoman court in Constantinople. The Ottoman Empire was a huge ramshackle power that stretched across the eastern Mediterranean. In 1799, it was under attack. Napoleon Bonaparte and the French army had just taken a chunk out of it in Egypt. Elgin's mission in Constantinople was to conclude an alliance between the Turkish Sultan and the British Crown against the French. Success in the East could buttress Britain's role as a world power and could make Lord Elgin's diplomatic career. But there was something else. The Turks controlled Athens and with it, access to the sites of classical antiquity. Elgin's mind went back to his estate at Broom Hall. Might it not benefit from the Greek connection? His architect thought so. It was an opportunity, said Harrison, for his lordship to send a team of artists to draw and measure the ancient temples. Precise plans made in Athens would mean beautiful results later in Scotland. The two men had talked themselves into something that would haunt Elgin for the rest of his life. In the fall of 1799, Lord Elgin and his young bride left London for Constantinople. It was a hard journey. The Mediterranean was a war zone and the captain of the frigate eager for action. Lady Elgin stayed below deck, two months pregnant and constantly sick. For her, it was three months of discomfort and distress. And then, Constantinople, gateway to the east. We arrived here yesterday evening, and I don't suppose any creature was ever more grateful for being at their journey's end. The entrance to this place surpasses all my expectations. 
I found a fine gilt chair with six men to carry it waiting my arrival. The young ambassador and his wife were swept up into a series of parties of extravagance and lavish exchanges. Two weeks, Elgin had spent his entire year's alliance, and he had yet to meet the Sultan, Selim III. If Elgin was to have success in Athens, it would be important to charm the despot. Selim's palace was off limits to foreign women, but this didn't deter Mary Elgin. Willful ambassador's wife accompanied her husband disguised as Lord Bruce. Together, they took their chances. It was a small room and dark. The bed upon which the monster sat was embroidered all over with immense large pearls, and at his side lay his sabre studded all over with thumping diamonds. You can conceive of nothing in the Arabian Nights equal to that room. The audience was a success. For Elgin, it opened the first door to Athens. What had been the capital of the ancient world was, in 1800, the 43rd city of the Ottoman Empire, a Turkish garrison town. Below the Acropolis was a maze of streets. Within its walls were a mosque, a barracks, and a harem. This is where Lord Elgin had sent his artists. They were led by Giovanni Battista Lucieri, a landscape painter from Naples. Talented, it was said, but cheap enough for Elgin to afford. With Lucieri were the craftsmen, the molders, the architects. They were to sketch the Acropolis, make casts, and take measurements. Two and a half thousand years old when Elgin's men got there, the temples were a triumph of survival over human indifference. A hundred years before, the Acropolis had been shelled by a besieging Venetian army. A cannonball had scored a direct hit sending tons of ancient marble crashing to the ground. The debris was being used by the Turkish soldiers to build their barracks. The temple had become a kind of quarry. <laughs> In charge of the Acropolis was the Turkish military governor, the Dizdar. To get past him, foreigners needed a special permit, a firman. Elgin's artists didn't have one. But the Dizdar was not above a bribe, and he liked the idea of having his portrait taken. As Lucieri sketched the Turk, his colleagues climbed up to the citadel with their scaffolding. And this was critical. For the artist needed to get above the Turkish houses in order to get close to the details on the temples. But in allowing the men to inspect the temples, the scaffolding had also invited them to inspect the harem. That was a problem, and not one solvable by a bribe. The Dizdar threw the foreigners off the citadel. There would be no further access to the Acropolis and the marbles without the permission of the Sultan. I beg your excellency, Luzieri wrote Elgin, send us a firman as soon as possible. News of the Athens fiasco reached Constantinople in the middle of the hot summer. Lord Elgin, already weak from the heat, fell into a fever.
dearest mother. He has been ill with rheumatism of the head for three days past. Dr. McLean made him put leeches on his temples last night, which I hoped would relieve him, but I am sorry to say he is still in great agony about the head. McLean says he never saw such leeches in his life. They bite much more than in England. I remain your very affectionate daughter, Mary Elgin, Ambassadress Extraordinary. Elgin was sick and demoralized. His project in Athens apparently at an end. Without the Sultan's permit or firman, Elgin's dream in Athens was over. But then the warriors did what the diplomat could not do. A British army had landed in Egypt, and joining forces with the Turks had driven the French out of the country. When the news reached Constantinople, the celebrations lasted all night continued for two weeks. The British and the ambassador extraordinary Lord Elgin were the most popular people in town. Elgin shook off his sickness and seized the moment. He wrote to the Sultan for the firman. Three weeks later, an extraordinary document arrived at the British Embassy. It was from the palace. Permission was being given to Elgin to erect scaffolding within the Acropolis, to excavate and take casts, and an additional unasked for privilege seemed to have been given. No one should meddle with their scaffolding, read the English translation, nor hinder them from taking away any pieces of stone. Qualche pezzi di pietra, the words have become famous. Some pieces of stone. Any? A few? Did Elgin have permission to take everything? The translation was hazy, its terms vague, but its royal signature was not. Within the hour, the Sultan's firman was dispatched to Athens. On the evening of the 23rd of July, 1801, Lucieri and the artists went up to the Acropolis with the permit. And before them, for the first time, within touching distance, the great works of the genius Phidias, ancient and impossibly beautiful. Five hundred miles away, Elgin urged his men on. How precious the moment is, what advantages there are. The permission being as extraordinary as the circumstances are precarious, I charge you to take care and to work well. They did. Shattered fragments were collected from the base of the Parthenon. And then Elgin's men looked to the Parthenon itself to the metopes on the building, directly beneath the cornice. A solid block of marble was chosen, two tons, 40 feet above ground. Was it possible to detach it? The idea was audacious, its repercussions breathtaking. If it were possible to remove one metal, it was possible to remove all of them. 30 laborers, Greeks, had been hired by Lucieri, and the ship's winching gear pressed into service. Saws arrived from Constantinople. 
and the operation to remove the first marble from the Parthenon began. was a fantastic success, and it seemed a vital one. The Turkish soldiers were now making mortar by taking marble from the Parthenon itself. Lucieri was horrified. It was now, he thought, a race between the infidels and the artists. I am sure that in half a century there will not remain one stone on top of another. It would be very well, my lord, to ask for all that is left, or else do all that is possible to prevent their going on in this fashion. Elgin was delighted by the test, though alarmed by the report of Turkish destruction. And there was something else he had just learned that Lucieri could not know. It concerned Napoleon. Although the French army had been vanquished from Egypt, it now appeared that 80 engineers had remained and they were at work dismantling and removing Egyptian antiquities. What was happening outside Cairo might soon happen in Athens. Elgin was tormented by two dreadful thoughts. The precious marbles could be ground to mortar by the Turks or stolen by the French. New instructions were sent to Lucieri in Athens. More was to be taken, and quicker. By the end of the summer, Elgin had 300 men dismantling the Acropolis. The object that I had in view, that seemed to meet with so many difficulties, now seems to promise a success beyond our most ardent hopes. In addition to the casts and the drawings, I could wish to have as many examples in the actual object of each thing. Each cornice, each frieze, each capital, of decorated ceilings, fluted columns, different architectural orders, as many metopes as you can, as much as possible. As the demands from Constantinople increased, the work in Athens became more frantic. More was asked for. More was risked. As Lord Elgin's men were gaining more marble in Athens, he was losing his wife to Constantinople. Leaving the self-enclosed world of the European embassies, Lady Elgin began to explore the qualities of the Ottoman court. It was a world away from Scotland. Maltese slaves, black eunuchs, and Persian troubadours. She was befriended by the ladies of the harem, who dressed the Scottish noblewoman like themselves. Dearest mother, I never knew what politeness was until I met the Turks. I have an audience at the palace, which of course I accepted, though I really dread it, for we must be up at four in the morning and remain there six hours to eat breakfast.
As the ambassador's wife threw herself into Constantinople, the ambassador withdrew further into his Athenian obsession. Elgin's eye was now fixed on the ultimate prize, the Caryatids, the female figures that supported the Erechtheum. They were the most beautiful of the temple sculptures that Lucieri had found, and, to the Athenians, the most sacred. The Greeks believed that these graceful goddesses, modeled on the maidens from the city of Caria, were more than just statues. They were real women, enchanted into stone by magicians. Bonaparte has not got such a thing from all his thefts in Italy. At Elgin's request, the best statue was taken and replaced with rough brick. It was soon adorned with spiteful graffiti. What the Goths here did not do was done by a Scot. Had Elgin's rescue become an act of vandalism? His accomplice Lucieri was beginning to wonder. At the end of the working day, the artist would stay on the Acropolis and continue to draw the temples. He soon realized he was being watched. Lucieri was sure it was an omen. The owl was the symbol of Athena, the goddess of the ancient temples. Athena who was wise and vengeful. Jealous, perhaps, of the marble that was now in Elgin's possession. Lord Elgin was now needed in Athens, and he was anxious to get there. On the 2nd of April, 1802, Lord and Lady Elgin arrived in Athens for the first time. They were eager to see the fruits of 18 months collecting. Elgin was exhilarated by the beauty of the marbles and by the fact that he now owned them. I am convinced that the object has been achieved. By the time my marbles arrive back in England, I will be able to show a complete representation of Athens. I think the few things that remain far more beautiful than I ever dared imagine. We got down everything we wanted from the Acropolis, so now we may boldly bid defiance to our enemy. By daylight, Lord Elgin was able to see both the glory and the degradation of the temples. He went in search of further sculptures on the site of a Turkish house. I excavated and found nothing. Then the Turk to whom the house belonged laughingly told me that the sculptures were made into mortar with which he built his home. Only then did I decide to rescue what remained from a similar fate. In truth, there was little left to take. His men had done their job well, and the priority now was to ship their haul back to London. Lord Elgin returned to Constantinople, leaving Lady Elgin in Athens to supervise the shipment. It was a cumbersome process, and time was short. Reports were coming in that the French Navy was gathering off the coast of Greece. And several rumors had it that the French had already landed on the peninsula. It was vital to get the precious cargo out of Greece quickly. The Greek workers were uneasy about their part in the removal of the marbles. On the road to Piraeus, their fears were confirmed. 
Inside the wagon was the last of the metals. It belonged to the goddess Athena. Athena the sea was Athena at war. sound was a warning, but Elgin was not there to listen. In Piraeus, there was now a problem. Few English naval captains wanted to be weighed down by such a heavy cargo, not with the French around. But Lady Elgin could be very persuasive. I have, by my management, got on board the horse's head, the urn, and the bas-relief from the Parthenon. I am now satisfied of what I always thought, which is how much more women can do if they set about it than men. I will lay a bet that had you been here, you would not have got half as much on board as I have. Do you love me better for it, Elgin? On the evening of the 15th of September, 1802, the mentor set off for Malta. There were no French ships in sight, but it was still a disastrous voyage. Within an hour of leaving Piraeus, storm clouds had gathered. The tiny brig, weighed down by its heavy cargo, was swept headlong towards the rocky island of Sariga. The captain made a desperate effort to enter the harbour. Sorry to say, the report is too well authenticated to leave us in the least doubt. It was a most violent storm. What a terrible stroke this is. Elgin desperately sought help, but was afraid to let anyone know about the preciousness of his cargo. To the British Consul at Malta. My brig, the Mentor, has foundered in attempting to enter the port at Cerigo. She had on board a quantity of stones, of no value of themselves, but of great consequence for me to secure. But it was hopeless and agonizing. The spilled treasure could be located, but not retrieved. Three months after the wreck, Lord Elgin's post in Constantinople ended. On the 16th of January, 1803, the Elgins and their three small children fled the plague-ridden city. They went straight to Cerigo, 
to see for themselves the wreck of the Mentor. The weather was dreadful and it was impossible attempting anything. In spring, divers are to go down to bring up the cases, but I fear it will cost a sad sum of money. It has already cost a great deal. Reluctantly, they decided to return to Scotland. The three children were sent ahead across the Bay of Biscay, but Lady Elgin declined to go by sea. So, taking advantage of the new peace in Europe, the Elgins travelled overland through Italy and France. They reached Paris just in time to see the fragile peace collapse. And Elgin became Napoleon's most prestigious prisoner. His hatred was personal. Lord Elgin, the man who had helped to plot his downfall in Egypt, the man who had his marbles. Napoleon had him jailed. 1803 to 1806, wasted years. Elgin, proud, ambitious Elgin, was now a civilian prisoner of war in France. He endured his imprisonment alone. Mary had been allowed to return to Scotland. When I think of all that you have suffered in Constantinople, my ill health, this detention, I am unable to bear myself. Our marriage has been a continuous scene of suffering to you. Elgin, dear Elgin, I am sorry I ever tormented you. Dearest Elgin, say that you do forgive me and that you know my heart is good. Lord Elgin, his career destroyed, his prospects hopeless. And his most valuable possessions at the bottom of the sea. The marbles and the man, both marooned, both beyond help. Not everything was lost. On the wreck of the Mentor, divers were at work, salvaging the crates of Greek sculpture. Lord Elgin, in captivity, had refused to forget about the marbles. The good news reached Elgin in his French jail. And more was to come. In 1806, he was released. The marbles were now sitting on a rocky outcrop on the island of Cerigo awaiting collection. At last, after four years of grief and disappointment, a ship from the Royal Navy's Mediterranean fleet brought the marbles back to England. Two weeks later, Lord Elgin arrived in Scotland. The rescue operation had cost Elgin 5,000 pounds, money he didn't have. But it didn't matter. He was now home, about to be reunited with his wife and family. A commissioned painting had already been completed to commemorate the homecoming. But the reunion never took place. Lord Elgin returned to find his wife living openly with another man. Consecutive years of pregnancy, ill health and misfortune had driven her away. I have gone through too much for four years past to go through it all again. Long have you known my sentiments and in one respect you have never regarded my feelings. The divorce created a lurid scandal. In court, family servants and chambermaids proved the adultery in humiliating detail. No further diplomatic posts came Elgin's way. He threw himself into finishing Broomhall. 
a new architect was hired. His brief, the same as the old one, to turn Broom Hall into a paragon of classical art. Using the drawings of the Acropolis that Elgin had brought back from Athens, the architect aimed to create a Parthenon of the North. A grand pediment was designed and half built when the money ran out again. It had to be pulled down. Elgin was bankrupt. The cost of removing 200 tons of marble and shipping it from Athens to London in the middle of a war had ruined him. He couldn't even get the marbles from London to Scotland, and they remained in a small warehouse off Park Lane. An extravagant secret. Although soon, artists discovered his collection. You have immortalized yourself, my lord. I draw at the marbles 10, 15 hours at a time, holding a candle and a board in one hand and drawing with the other. That horse's head is the highest effort of human conception and execution. The eye, the nostril and the mouth, it is enough to breathe fire into the marble, enough to create a soul. When Elgin read this, he understood all was not lost and that the marbles had the power to save him yet. His dreams of a Greek revival in England could still happen. The public would demand it. To make sure they did, Elgin organized a boxing match that would allow spectators to compare forms ancient and modern. Fashionable London came to admire the pugilists trading blows amidst the marble. Elgin's show was a typical gamble. Either he'd be knocked out or the public. a resounding success, and soon the little museum was packed with Londoners marvelling at the glory of Athens. The pristine marbles dumbfounded and confounded people. A union of greatness and nature, wrote the landscape painter Farrington, and rescued from barbarism and eternal. The famous actress Mrs. Siddons was reduced to tears in front of Theseus while the society of the dilettanti was so confused by the sculpture's apparent modernity that they pronounced them fakes. You have lost your labor, my lord. Your marbles are overrated. They are not Greek. They are Roman, of the time of Hadrian. Elgin shrugged off this ridiculous claim, but was unaware that a far greater critic had just reached the Acropolis. In 1809, Lord Byron, romantic poet and Greek sympathizer, had arrived in Athens. When he saw the desolation caused by Elgin's activity, he was outraged. How dare he steal from the temple of the gods? Byron wrote an elegant and venomous poem, Child Harold. It was intended in part destroy Elgin. But most the modern Picts ignoble boast to rive what Goth and Turk and time hath spared. Cold as the crags upon his native coast, his mind as barren and his heart as hard, is he whose head conceived, whose hand prepared to displace Athena's poor remains. Byron's poem, 
famous across Europe, had wounded Elgin very badly. The marbles had cost him his liberty, his money, and his wife. Now he stood to lose his reputation. As he began to organize his defense, he was met with a further onslaught from critics. In the first instance, it appears to me a very flagrant piece of injustice to deprive a helpless and friendly nation of any possession of value. Having seen their carelessness, I found myself bound to remove any pieces of statuary that were in danger and to ensure all was done to protect them. stupid wonder stare and marvel at his lordship's stone shop there. It was my original intention to remove only my cast and models and that not the filthy actors. jackal loathed in life nor pardoned in dust. It was the lowest moment yet. Financially, the news was also very bad. The final cost of bringing the marbles back to England was 70,000 pounds. Debtor's prison loomed. So, in 1814, Elgin asked the government to buy the marbles off him. But was the government about to accept stolen goods? A House of Commons select committee was set up to determine the legality of the sale. <clears throat> Did your lordship, for your own satisfaction, keep any copy of the permissions? No, I never did. The whole thing was done publicly before the whole world. I employed three or four hundred a day. You state you have rescued the remains from danger? Every traveller coming added to the general defacement of the statuary, and the Turks had been continually defacing the heads. It was with these feelings that I proceeded to remove as much of the sculpture as I conveniently could. The committee felt unqualified to judge the legality of Elgin's actions in Greece, but offered to pay 35,000 pounds for the marbles, half the asking price. Elgin was mortified, but there was nothing he could do. In June 1816, Elgin's marbles were installed in the British Museum. They're still there. All Thomas Elgin wanted was sketches for his house. But in his great passion for Greek architecture, he defiled its very symbol, the Parthenon. Yet he preserved the sculpture forever. Elgin's marbles, Phidias's marbles, are now wanted back in Athens. Perhaps they always were. In 1801, Elgin's men had been observed on the Acropolis by an old Athenian. You English are carrying off the works of the Greeks, our forefathers. Preserve them well. One day we Greeks will come and redemand them. After selling the marbles for half his asking price, Lord Elgin returned to Scotland a broken man. Broom Hall, the Parthenon of the North, was put into trust. Elgin was forced to leave it. To escape his creditors, he fled to Paris, the site of his former imprisonment. He never saw Broomhall again. 